Okay, let's begin. Thank you for coming. How come we're missing so many people today? Halloween, they're recovering. All right, well, that's unfortunate. Okay, the first thing I want to do, remember I told you before, I, I had said for those, those of you who were using PrepU, if you used it, uh, what was it, I think 11 or 12 times, I was going to give away some more movie passes. So I need someone to pick a number for me between 1 and 15. Give me a number between 1 and 15. 11. 11. Camille Lee. Ah, you get $25 in movie passes. Now, let me tell you this. So for five weeks, some of you had access to Prep U. I don't know if it helped or didn't help. Where are you? There you are. I don't know if it helped or not, but I'm going to switch. Those of you who didn't have access to it, you're going to have access to it now, which means I'm going to be offering some movie passes to you guys in the next few weeks. Uh, the downside is this. Remember that horrible test we had to take on day one? We have to take it again. It only, it, it only takes 20 minutes, and it, it doesn't, you gotta, you're helping me become a better teacher, right? It will not affect your grade. I will not put it on the grade sheets at all. It will never be associated with your name. But I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to do some scientific method here to figure out if having access to uh, some multiple choice questions online helps or not. So we're going to give you, if your name is A through K, you get the blue form. If your name starts with L through Z, you take the, the pinkish orange form. As I said, it, it doesn't matter. So you don't have to try if you don't want. But I'd, I'd like you to spend 20 minutes, go through, answer them if you can. If you can't answer them, don't. And then we'll move on. And in exchange, those of you who now are going to get an email from me having access to prep you, you're going to have uh, the chance to win some movie passes. Question. Uh, no, you can't use pen, but we have some pencils. And so I will pass these around as well. Don't, don't stress out about it at all. Just look at it. It might help you. Oops, there you go. Okay, don't, don't start it until, until everyone has it. So I'll, I'll tell you when to go. You have one? Pencil? Yeah. Hi. Sure. Oops, okay, here, can, can you pass this pencil down? And that one. All right. Where it asks for test form, you'll see on the upper right-hand corner of the test, it'll say A or B. are pretty crappy. Yeah. Okay, 
Everybody almost has them. I'll pick this. Okay, you, you can start. As I, as I said, just make sure you've got your name and also on the side that, okay, that has your student ID number, put those in. As I said, I will never put those on the grade sheet. It won't influence it. I'll never know what you got. And take about 20 minutes. Thank you, I do appreciate your doing this.
Okay, if you could pass them across to the aisle. Also pass the pencil too, if you took one of the pencils. I appreciate you doing this. I was thinking, sitting there feeling bad that you're all taking a test, so I thought I should do something nice. How about, do you guys like cookies? Yes? All right, how about, I'll bring you cookies on Tuesday. <laughs> and vegan cookies? Do they sell them at Didi Reese? No. All right, I'll bring one vegan cookie for you. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I do appreciate that. Uh, plus one vegan. So that'll be for Tuesday. Okay. Today what we're going to do is continue talking about nutrition and digestion. And the first thing I want to do is talk about the fact that diets vary considerably among animals. You'll see a whole range of them. Uh, so for instance, you have herbivores, which are going to get, for, first of all, I'm going to focus only on animals here, uh, but I should make the point that the entire purpose of, digest of the digestive system is straightforward. It's that we need both energy and raw materials uh, to build tissue and to live. And so the question is going to be, how are we going to get that energy? How are we going to get the raw materials? And most plants and some bacteria are able to capture the energy from the sun through photosynthesis. We're not going to go through the steps of photosynthesis, but that energy the plants use, and they can build tissue. So you, know, you see all these trees here, all of the leaves, all of the material in the, in the trunk, all of that has been generated by the energy from the sun. I like this uh, picture here. It's a cross section of a plant. And you can actually see all those little balls. Those are chloroplasts. So they are little, little tiny factories that when the, the sun hits them, the energy from that, they're able to capture it, you know, this uh, energy and then CO2, invisible CO2 that's in the environment. And they're able to take the carbon dioxide, which has carbon, and when they get enough of them, they stick them together. Remember when I gave you the description of what glucose was? It was six carbons attached to each other. So if you take enough carbon dioxide, you can cram them together and you take something that was an invisible gas and it turns into something solid that can be a food. Now, from the animal, per animal perspective, no animals can, can generate their, their energy and raw materials from the sun. So we've got to rely on, on eating plants, eating the organisms that can capture it. So you have things like zebras grazing here. They get all of their energy from plants. Uh, you've got tortoises here. They're just another species, another example of herbivores. They eat only, only plants. You've got, this is something called a shield bug. A lot of bugs uh, feed uh, exclusively on plants. Here you can see, uh, get a sense of the amount of damage they can do to crop plants. Imagine that you're a farmer and you're going to generate money by selling these plants. And so you've got these bugs that can completely go through and wipe out uh, plants billions of dollars in damage each year. This is why the, the pesticide industries are big and so on. I like this. This is a bean weevil. Uh, they actually, they'll bore into a leaf and they just sit there eating it. Uh, looks like a, something out of Star Wars. But they, they can just sit there eating it and they're, they're fine. They get all their energy. The plant takes a hit and if there is a human who's actually growing the plant, then they take a hit as well. So those are herbivores. Uh, then you've got carnivores that are animals that exclusively consume other animals. So you've got a cheetah here taking down a gazelle. And what else? There's a, a whole range of carnivores. I showed you this one before. This bat is a type of bat that only eats animals. This one eats frogs. Uh, what else? We've got a snake here. So this is a non-venomous snake, but it's eating something called a lava lizard. So you've got a huge number uh, of snakes that tend to eat uh, other animals. All spiders are carnivores as well. You know, they build their net, net, sorry, their web, not to catch plants, but to catch other, other bugs that go through, and then they get all of their energy that way. Then you've got uh, the group, sort of a catch-all omnivores that eat both plants and animals. Classic example of an omnivore, omnivore tends to be humans. There are certainly some, some humans who consume only 
uh, only plants. There are other, other humans. I, I think my dad maybe is the only one who only eats animals. Um, <laughs> but in general, humans tend to eat a mixture of both plants and animals. Another very successful group of omnivore, omnivores would be these cockroaches. Uh, sorry, that's what, that's what will happen if you leave food out and you go away for the weekend. Uh, we'll never do that again, never. Uh, anyway, so you have a whole range. There are different ways that you can get them. But in every case, whether you're eating a plant or you're eating an animal or you're eating an animal that eats animals that eats plants, you're still taking tissue that has carbon-carbon bonds. You're breaking those bonds, the bonds between the carbons and the hydrogens, and the energy that's released, you are extracting that energy. If there are nitrogen atoms, you're taking those, you're going to build proteins from them. It's always the same process. Uh, one little thing here I thought just as a, a sidelight, sometimes people tend to think that uh, something that sets humans apart is that we have agriculture, and by that I mean uh, horticulture, pastoralism, where you cultivate plants or animals so you can consume them. For a long time, people thought, ah, we're the only ones, so that's a defining feature of humans, but it's not. There are some species of ants, they're called leafcutter ants, and they're very interesting because what they'll do is they'll go out and they'll chop up leaves, and you'll even see them walking back to where their colony is, and an individual ant will be holding something that might be from here to the roof, walking with it, and they get there and they start chewing it up, but they don't eat plants. They chew it up for a while, they then spit it out, and they take this gross sort of mulch that comes out of their mouth, and they mold it with their little, their little appendages into this honeycomb of gooey stuff. Uh, and you can imagine what happens if you took a bunch of pre-chewed food out of your mouth and you left it on the counter. Stuff grows on it. And what happens is mold grows on this chewed up stuff that they spit out. They then go and they take the mold, they scrape the mold off, and they eat the mold. So what they're doing is they have these massive colonies underground where they are cultivating fungus. So we're not special. Ants can do it too. Um, there, there may be other species. There are probably other species of ants, but the leafcutter ants are well known. In any case, though, the important thing here is that processing it, getting energy from whatever it is that you eat, always is a similar process process regardless of where the original source of the energy is. Uh, you, do, you do have a couple of groups of organisms that it's tough to figure out where they go. The fluid feeders primarily, uh, they tend to get lumped with carnivores, so you've got mosquitoes. They don't actually consume entire animals, but they take the fluid from them. So, you know, you have a mosquito here. You can actually see the proboscis. Uh, it's red, blood, you know, it gets blood. Uh, by sticking it into the skin. I'm not a huge fan of them, uh, but they get squished afterwards. But they live on the nutrients that you get. So you consume food. There's sugar in your blood. There's protein in your blood. Uh, it's kind of a gross one to look at. We'll, we'll move on to this happy picture. Uh, so let's ask the question then, how much food do you need? Because I'm interested in food. I'm interested in knowing what happens if you consume less food. Uh, if you consume too much, you can do some interesting ca uh, calculations. And the, they hinge on the, the standard unit of energy that we'll talk about is the kilocalorie. It gets a little bit confusing because there is a unit of energy called the calorie, but it's relatively small. It is defined as how much energy is needed to take one gram of water. One gram of water is really tiny. Uh, and take that one gram of water and increase its temperature by one degree centigrade, that is a calorie. If you take a thousand of those, or the amount of energy required to raise a thousand grams of water, that's called a kilocalorie. But because that's a more meaningful unit for humans, most people drop off kilocalorie and they tend to call that a calorie. So there's some situations where people can be confused. They, they say calorie, they'll say, oh, this, you know, a soda has 130 calories. They really mean 130 kilocalories. Anyway, so that's what it is. It's a, it's a unit of energy. On average, 120 pound female would require anywhere from 1,800 to 2,400 kilocalories per day. 160 pound male would be about 2,400 to 3,200 kilocalories per day. These vary a lot. That's a huge range that I put up there because it depends on how active you are. 
All activity requires energy. All energy requires fuel. And the fact that there's so much variation from one individual to, to another, if you think about it, uh, the amount of energy you burn off, maybe walking down to, from the dorms every day and back, maybe you make two trips, and you compare it with someone else, maybe your grandmother who just sits at home all day and watches TV or something like that, or anyone who sits around and doesn't have much activity, you realize that it's hard. If you want to say anything meaningful about, well, how much energy does an elephant require? How much energy does a dog require? It depends on how active they are. So biologists have come up with an idea, something called basal metabolic rate. And what basal metabolic rate is, it's defined this way. It says, all right, if we rule out all activity and instead we say, how much would it take just for you to sit on that couch? In other words, breathing, uh, having your brain function. That way we can standardize it across all people and it gets a little bit easier. There's a little bit less variation. And for humans, uh, we're looking at about 1,400 kilocalories per day for that same female, about 1,700 kilocalories for the male. All cells require energy to function, and so if you are physically bigger, you have more cells that need energy to function. That's why we have the difference here between males and females. If you're a bigger female, then you're going to require slightly more. This is the equivalent of the amount, so it's not very much the amount of energy that it takes to, to run a 75 watt light bulb for 24 hours, that would be if you had no activity at all. So it's interesting to look from species to species and I'll show you why. Because BMR, basal metabolic rate, varies a lot from species to species. In particular, for humans that turns out to be about one calorie, and I mean a real calorie here, per gram per hour. So you could figure out for yourself, how many grams do you weigh 24 hours in a day? You can figure out how many calories per day you need. But there are other animals, like a shrew, this is something called, uh, this is the pygmy shrew, the smallest mammal. It weighs about 2.2 grams. So that's less than a dime. They're really tiny. Uh, you've got other, other shrews. They're all approximately the same, but the elephant shrew is slightly bigger. That's why it's called the elephant shrew, but they weigh about five grams, so they're really tiny. Your average mouse that you might get if you went to a pet store and bought a pet mouse would be probably 25 grams. So these are really tiny. But shrews can have a heart rate of about 500 beats per minute at rest. What is your heart rate at rest? about 70. So yeah, almost, almost 10 times as much. So they are just, you know, it's like you're sitting there with your, your foot on the gas pedal, you know, just revving the engine really high. Uh, but th this is not just meaningless numbers, this 35 times a as high, because we can figure out this. How much food does a shrew need per day? See if you can solve it. Imagine that the shrew weighs five grams. So we'll, we'll do the elephant shrew. Weighs five grams. <coughs> Did you figure it out? I want, you to, I, I want you to figure it out. A five gram shrew, how much food does it need to get every day? There's a reason why we're, we're gonna think about this. Something that I, that I told you on Tuesday, I want to reinforce that. All right, how do, how do you do it? Did, I, did anybody figure it out? Nobody figured it out? You figured it out. Well, one calorie per gram per hour, and five grams. No, no, no. Oh, it's not one. This is a shrew. Okay, that's good. Okay, yes. Yeah, so. I don't know if that's the number I got, but that's that's the, the same way that I did. Maybe I did. So I said it was a five gram shrew. I just did the 35 uh, calories uh, per gram per hour right here, times 24 hours in a day. 
So maybe you didn't multiply by the 24 hours in a day. So, so what, what did we get? 4,200 4, or 4.2 kilocalories per day. This still doesn't seem that interesting. I promise you it'll be interesting. At least to me, it's really interesting. So this shrew, this five gram, sh gram shrew needs 4.2 kilocalories per day. What do we know about the contents of food? How many calories are in it? Remember from the label I asked you, how, mu how much energy is in uh, carbohydrates? How much is in protein? How much is in lipids? All right, no, I want to know specifically how many calories are in a gram of carbohydrates? Four. So we just learned something. If you could get, and that's actually four kilocalories uh, per gram of carbohydrates. So how much food does a shrew have to eat? Yeah. If it has 4.5 zero kilocalories per gram, and it needs 4.2 kilocalories per day, it needs about a gram of carbohydrates. This is for basal metabolic rate. So this is for the shrew to sit on the couch all day. Think about that. You don't seem like it's interesting. One gram, this is a five gram shrew. It needs to get 20% of its body weight. If you weigh 200 pounds, how much food is that per day? 40 pounds of food. So think about that. You're a 200 pound guy. You gotta go out and you gotta get 40 pounds of food today. And then tomorrow you have to find 40 pounds of food. Did I do the math right? I did do the math right. However, that was just to support you sitting on the couch. The very act of finding 40 pounds of food takes a lot of energy. On average, it's about double. So for basal metabolic rate, we were saying 4.2. We're actually going to say it needs 8.4 kilocalories per day. So now you need 2 grams of food, 40% of your body weight. So you weigh, let's say you weigh 100 pounds instead. It's easier to do the math. Uh, so you need 40, 40 pounds of food if you weigh 100. Does anyone here weigh 100 pounds? No one weighs 100. You weigh about 100 pounds? So, so we're going to get 40 pounds of food. What would that be? 160 quarter pounders uh, every day. If you're a 200 pound guy, what is it? 80 pounds of food every day. So here's why this is interesting. Because protein also, you're going to need the same amount, 40 pounds of food. But fat, 9 kilocalories per gram. So if you're this shrew and you have the option when you go out there, you could eat some carbohydrates. In other words, you could munch on some grass, something like that, or some protein. Maybe you find a nut. On the other hand, if you find some fat, you can just kick back. You need half as much food. And so now can you imagine how powerful natural selection is going to be selecting for a preference for fatty foods? It makes your life infinitely easier. If you are that shrew, suddenly you spend half as much time looking for food. So if your brain is built in such a way that when you munch on a bit of fat, bells and whistles go off and they're like, ding, 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 eat this again. Find this. Spend your time eating this. Forget about the stupid carbohydrates because, you know, you're not getting anything. It's like munching on packing material compared to fat. Anyway, so that is relevant for humans as well. We don't need quite so much because our basal metabolic rate is significantly lower, but the issue is the same. Every time you find fat, you're saving yourself an enormous amount of time. And what's the shrew going to use with, do with all that extra time? Party, exactly. They can maximize their reproductive success. And that's why the shrews that have that taste preference are the ones that we see today. The ones that didn't have that taste preference died off. They don't do as well. Here's our first take-home message. We only have two today. Basal metabolic rate. And is the energy expenditure necessary to keep a resting animal alive? It varies depending on how big you are. It varies depending on what species you are. Biology books, when they talk about the energy expenditure of animals, always tend to 
make comparisons of basal metabolic rate, which really annoys me because it's a completely bogus measure, right? No animal sits on the couch all day. Animals are running around all the time, and that varies a lot. So it's, I don't like it very much, but the only reason it's used is that it's very easy to measure. You go out in the wild, you find an animal, you bring it in somewhere, you put it in a little tiny cage uh, for 24 hours or 48 hours, and you just you measure uh, how much energy is being burned. And you can do that based on the CO2 that's produced and all that. But it doesn't, you know, it, it's not that meaningful. I worked in a lab with a guy who, for a while, who pioneered this method of measuring basal metabolic rate, and he was so excited about it that he could do it. He just, he was contacting zoos all over the country. What animals do you have? We're going to bring them in. And so every day you'd go in, and at first it was just all these little cages that were completely airtight so they could, you know, measure how much air goes in and how much comes out. But then he started getting elephants in there, and he, he couldn't get cages big enough, so he had these, like, garbage cans that he would cut, and he would mount them over the front of the elephant and then seal it around their nose so he could measure everything going in and out. He had kangaroos, llamas. It was really a silly lab. Uh, <laughs> Some, yes, question. Uh, good question. In hibernation, uh, what happens to that basal metabolic rate? It goes way down. And so that's been a really important physiological adaptation that you, uh, certain animals have evolved so that they can really slow it down so that they literally can stay on the couch for months at a time. They still need some, though, so they're still burning it off. That's why before you go into hibernation, you have to really pack it on. Uh, and you're not acquiring anymore. You're not having any reproductive success. So as a long-term strategy to hibernate forever doesn't make any sense. But if your, your environment regularly goes through a real crunch period where you're not finding any food, that can be a good strategy. People have tried experiments where they take the regular food of animals and they say, well, what if you know, we have the shrew in the lab and I take a bunch of the food uh, that it's eating. I take, you know, Purina shrew food. Uh, they actually have Purina mouse chow. And I add in a bunch of undigestible material so that the pellet is the same size, it weighs the same size, but parts of it that are in there can't be digested. Usually they're pieces of like rubber or plastic. Uh, and they get passed right through. The first thought was, aha, they've just got this measurement of how much am I consuming. <laughs> And no one cares really about how much food mice or shrews are eating, but they're thinking about humans. And they thought, uh, what if we could add non-nutritive material to the food uh, since the animals, uh, at first they didn't know this, they said maybe we can get people to eat less. So the question is, what do humans do? And what is the, the, the best example of food that maybe you've eaten before that has had non-nutritive material added to it on purpose? High-fiber stuff, but it hasn't been added. That stuff just is natural. I want to know where seaweed, same thing. It's already, that's true that it has it. I want to know where humans have consciously said, let's add some crap to the food so that people can't digest it. Oh, well, artificially colored food? Artificially colored, yeah, that's not adding a whole lot of substance. One tiny bit can color everything. What's that? Candy corn? No, that's, no, that's actual real digestible sugar. You've never eaten anything that intentionally had non-digestible stuff in it? you never heard of Wow Chips? What? No. Oh, come on. Uh, Alestra? <laughs> Do you guys live under a rock? <laughs> this is, this uh, was this creation that was made. It's on the market. You have all, I would gar guarantee that at least 30% of you have consumed it. Uh, you may not have known it, but it is a material that that has one part of the molecule looks like a fat. And the other part of the molecule, what they've done is they've engineered, you know, we can, we can hydrogenate vegetable oils. They've engineered it such that it can't be broken down. And what they've done is they've made the hydrocarbon tails really long, and they've done a couple of other things. So what happens is you put it into your mouth, and the part that looks like a lipid, your tongue is like, mmm, that's fat, that's really good. And they put this in potato chips. And people consume it, and they're like, hmm, this is really good. I'm eating these potato chips. They taste kind of greasy. Uh, they're good. And the idea was you would eat X amount of those potato chips like you normally would. But because your body can't digest it, after you've gotten the payoff of the taste, it would go through your digestive system. Your body's trying to break it down. It can't. And you would excrete it. Seems like a good deal, right? 
you get all the payoff of having your body think you've consumed something good, but you don't actually extract any energy from it. So the amount of calories is very little. And sadly, uh, in the case of, of that, people up their consumption. Your body doesn't immediately know it, but somehow it has these sensors. How many calories did we just take in? Same thing goes with cookies that are made with NutraSweet. We talked about this in Mean Genes, the example where the scientists had, did a study where they had cookies available for people, and they looked at how much they ate, then they replaced them with cookies that had uh, an artificial sweetener that had no calories, and they ate the same amount. Everybody thought, wow, this is great. We can actually reduce people's consumption by tricking them. And it was a big expose that, that uh, after this study was done, they realized if you followed the people for the whole day, the people who had the low calorie cookies during the rest of the day ate more food so that at the end of the day, their consumption was exactly the same. So for a minute they were tricked, but later their body is like, wow, I'm still hungry for, for one reason or another. So our bodies have very sophisticated ways of, of determining what, what food intake we're, we're getting. And it's very, very hard to trick it. And there's a huge industry. The, the people who come up with ways of, of having people eat as much as they want but lose weight are going to be very, very rich. It's a, it's a huge market. Okay, so I want to talk now about what goes on when you actually consume food. Where does it get broken down? How does it get broken down? We'll see that there are four stages. Ingestion, where you put it in your mouth, takes five to 10 seconds. Digestion can take anywhere from two to six hours, depending on what it is that you've eaten. Absorption, where you actually, so in, ingestion and digestion are about breaking down the food physically into smaller parts. Absorption is where the carbohydrates, the proteins, and the lipids actually move into your bloodstream and then can get sent to the cells of your body. That can take five to six hours. All these hinge on how much food is in your digestive system. And then elimination, where you get rid of the non-digestible stuff after you've recovered a lot of water and a lot of the nutrients. So we'll look at these four steps. And what I want to think about is, let's say you had something like a hamburger. Not everyone here maybe eats meat, but imagine some food that has protein, fats, carbohydrates. And during ingestion, ingestion, there's not a whole lot going on here. Uh, but there are reasons. So you've got your tongue is going to play an important part. We have a very big tongue. Uh, but, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, here's a close-up of it. About two-thirds of it is, is muscle, the bottom two-thirds there that allows it to move in a lot of different ways. Uh, up close, this is also the tongue up close. It's not as smooth as it looks. It's got uh, a bunch of receptor molecules that respond to different chemicals uh, and tell your brain what it tastes like. Anyway, if you begin eating a hamburger, you're gonna, your teeth are going to tear into it. They're going to grind and bite it into little bits. Having food in your mouth stimulates your salivary glands. This is the important first step in digestion because they see, secrete mucus and something called alpha amylase. Did any of you do the experiment I told you to do with the bagel? Did, you, did it work? Not so well? You got to do it for a long time. You, so you bite into it, you let it just sit on your tongue, hold it there. Right, well, I want you to try it again. Come on. Okay, by next time. Otherwise, uh, when I bring the cookies in, I won't give you the cookies unless somebody has done the bagel trick. Can I just give you bagels instead? Okay. Sorry, he said it was his idea. Uh, the salivary glands produce saliva. Saliva has uh, alpha amylase. Any enzyme, something that breaks down the food you consume, is always going to end in ASE. That means it's an enzyme. All that it does is break down sugars, starches primarily. That's why, as I told you, you have the complex carbohydrates. They get chopped into individual sugars that stimulate the taste buds on your tongue that you have simple sugars there. All the while, as your teeth are, are chewing it, the reason they're doing this is that when the food gets into your stomach, your body can only absorb individual sugars 
uh, individual components of fatty acids and the proteins have to be broken down into amino acids. So your body breaks everything down, then it rebuilds it into whatever it needs later. So in order to get the most out of your food, you have to chop it up as much as possible so the enzymes can break it down. Finally then, uh, as your tongue kind of shapes it into a, a ball of goo, gets pushed to the back of your mouth, the pharynx, this is just the opening that can go down to your lungs or to your stomach. You've got a little circular uh, bit of muscle that closes around your trachea so that the food doesn't go into your lungs. And you have something called the epiglottis that covers it. Um, finally, the food goes down the esophagus. And this is going to be the tube that goes into your stomach. And then you've got a fairly long tube that has to go from the back of your mouth down into your stomach. And there's muscle all around it. And you don't control that muscle. You can't the way you can tell your arm to co contract and so you can lift something. You can't tell it, but the presence of the food there causes these contractions that slowly squeeze it down and into your stomach. So at this point, any protein that's in the food that you've eaten isn't being broken down. Any lipids that are in the food you're eating, not broken down. The carbohydrates are beginning to be broken down. Probably 20% of them get broken down in your mouth. Oh, here's something. I, I spent a lot of time watching birds. Uh, I did some behavior studies on birds. And you'll notice they eat gravel. I wasn't studying their uh, eating biology or their digestion or anything, but when you're watching pigeons for a long time, it gets really boring. Uh, and so I started to realize, wow, they're all eating gravel. Are they really that stupid? Uh, and they're not. I mean, they are, sorry. Uh, they're very stupid, but... Uh, but not for eating the gravel. Birds don't have teeth. By eating gravel, what happens is it goes into their stomach, and because this key component of digestion is you've got this food, you have to break it into the, the smallest pieces. You have to have the largest surface area so that the enzymes can get there and separate out the individual amino acids, the individual uh, simple sugars. You need to do anything you can to do that. And so the birds, by eating gravel, are able to, to break it down a little bit better. All right, anyway, so step two, digestion. We're only going to cover two steps today. Uh, sorry, there's a question way there in the back. No, it's good. So digestion is where you're going to now seriously break it down into its component molecules. First step is your esophagus dumps it into your stomach, and there is another big round a uh, bit of muscle that closes off to present, prevent regurgitation. And as soon as you have food in your stomach, two things get secreted. HCL, which stands for hydrochloric acid, and something else called pepsinogen, and that becomes pepsin. That is going to, uh, these are both going to help break down food. Question? Yeah, um, you have a serious picture of like regurgitation. Do people with acid reflux not have? Yeah, so the question is, people with acid reflux, what happens? Yeah, they have a problem that the, the muscle there can't close all the way. And we'll see, because your, your stomach secretes hydrochloric acid, it's really acidic there. So uh, any time it oozes its way back up, up your esophagus, uh, you feel a burning sensation because that is an acid, the hydrochloric acid, touching your esophagus. So you want to do anything you can to keep that muscle closed. How many of you have vomited before? The horrible, horrible uh, uh, taste is because of all that crappy food you eat. No, uh, no, it depends on how long it's been since you eat the food. It tends to be the acid. The acid in it really burns the esophagus as it, as it comes back up. Pepsin is a protease, so ASE, it's an enzyme. Pro, it's an enzyme that breaks down protein. So this is gonna be where the first breakdown of protein comes. 
your stomach churns. You have muscles all around it. So you've added acid. You've added something that breaks down proteins into their component amino acids. Hydrochloric acid also denatures proteins. By denature, I mean you take a long sequence of amino acids, chop, 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 and those amino acids can be absorbed later on into your bloodstream. So that's good. The end result is something that no longer looks like food. It's called chyme. This is why the longer it's been since you ate, if you do vomit, the less and less it's going to look like the food because you've had hydrochloric acid and pepsin working on it, turning it into something different from what it originally was. If you add lettuce in that burger that we ate, the lettuce is going to be largely undigested. There's cellulose in the cell wall, so that is a, a complex carbohydrate, but your body can't break it down. If there are any lipids, so there was fat maybe in the hamburger, they're just suspended there. They don't dissolve. They don't get broken down yet. Finally, at the other end of your stomach, you've got another circular bit of muscular tissue. And what that's going to do is it opens up, and a tiny bit of the chyme gets squirted out into your small intestines. They have some videos you can see of your stomach as you've eaten a big meal, as it churns away in the stomach, and then sends it to the small intestines where you're going to have the absorption done. And it's really gross. It opens up a tiny bit, and you just see this little squirting through of this highly acidic, uh, very gross-looking uh, material. Sorry. Here's something that's interesting. These are pretty harsh conditions in the stomach. You've got that acidic nature of hydrochloric acid. You've got various other enzymes so that can interact with it. Humans have done some interesting things. The more you can break down your food, the better you can absorb the nutrients from it. And so anthropologists have had a field day thinking about this and looking at the fact that we have begun cooking food in high temperatures. High temperatures break down proteins. They also tend to break down uh, a little bit the lipids and carbohydrates a little bit as well. Also, if you marinate things in harsh acids, things like lime juice or vinegar, those are acids just like in your stomach. So it's the equivalent of you know putting the food in someone else's stomach for a while, and then you eat it, and you're able to get more out of it. You could say, well, this is just a coincidence. But you could test it with that, you know, this is a hypothesis that people marinate food in certain things in order to extract more energy out of it. Think about how you would test that hypothesis. You'd say, well, there are probably similar seeming substances that don't have the ability to break down the food to free it up to interact with enzymes better. I would predict that the frequency of marination in those things is really, really low. The frequency of marination in highly acidic things, very high. And then I could go and I could test those data. How often do you marinate something in water? Almost never. Or milk? Almost never. Right, there's a question to, to ponder. Question over here. Uh, the question is, is that why humans were not meant to eat meat? Ah, uh, that's a tricky word, meant, uh, meant to eat. I don't know who intended it. It, it is a, an explanation for why just eating raw meat maybe tends not to lead to a huge intake of protein. We're not that good at getting all of the, the macromolecules from it, so we need help. But uh, you could just as easily say, ah, so the fact that we were able to invent cooking means that we were meant to eat meat. So sorry. I don't know one way or another how I'd explain it. But the fact that we process it beforehand allows us to eat meat pretty efficiently. What is indigestion? So you sort of hit at this when you talk about acid reflux. Indigestion, uh, people talk about heartburn, has nothing to do with your heart. It's when you have an acidic uh, bit of fluid touching your esophagus. So again, people, uh, the, the circular muscle at the bottom of the esophagus opens up a little bit. and you can get that acidic material into the esophagus and it burns. Antacids cure this 
But the way they do it is they neutralize the acid that's in your stomach. Is that a good idea? No. The way I just said, the whole point of having your stomach be acidic is that it causes the food to be broken down in ways that you can extract energy from it. So the antacid makes you feel better, but it also reduces your efficiency at digesting the food. So maybe once in a while, it's okay to take them. But if you're the kind of person who every time you eat something, you want to do that, uh, there's a bigger problem there. And that's probably not the solution because you're going to reduce uh, your ability to extract the proper nutrients from it. Uh, so here, here's a question that I, I already told you about Diet Coke that NutraSweet is made from a sweetener called aspartame. And so I told you that phenylalanine was one of the amino acids. The other one is called aspartic acid. And aspartic acid and phenylalanine hooked together stimulate the, the sweet sensation, sensing taste buds on your tongue. If you take a can of Diet Coke, and I learned this firsthand, I went to my parents' house once, and I forget why, I was going up there for an interview somewhere in San Francisco, and I got there, and I woke up late, and I got up in the morning, and I said, okay, uh, you know, I don't have time for anything, it was about eight in the morning, and I left, I said, do you have anything like a Diet Coke that can wake me up? And my mom's like, well, we don't drink so much of that. She's like, I think we have some. So she goes to the closet uh, where the washing machine and dryer are and stacked out there are some sodas. And so I take a can of soda and I'm driving, driving into San Francisco and I'm drinking the soda and it's horrible. It tastes like, have you ever had warm water with a bunch of salt dissolved in it? No, you shouldn't. That's what it tasted like. And I couldn't understand. The fizziness kept triggering something. I'm like, yeah, I'm drinking Diet Coke and it's just at room temperature. That's what the problem is. But finally, when I was about three quarters of the way done with the can, I realized it wasn't sweet at all. And I tried to figure out why, and then it dawned on me. Uh, heat denatures proteins. Heat causes amino acids to separate from each other. If you separate the phenylalanine and the aspartic acid, they don't have their sweetness anymore. All they are is two free amino acids sitting there. And so if you do this experiment, uh, when you do the, the bagel experiment, take a Diet Coke, put it somewhere where it's really warm for a while. It takes a while. Uh, you, know, you have to have a lot of hours in very, very high heat. But try that and see if you can get the taste to, to be really foul. Question. Ah, good question. Am I saying that by cooking food you make it more nutritious? Got to be careful with the word. Nu nutritious tends to mean what is the level of this vitamin, this mineral, or or this bit of, of carbohydrate or something like that. So I wouldn't say more nutritious. I would say your efficiency at extracting the nutrition that is there is in, is increased. No, that tends to be a, mis, uh, a misconception that people have because what happens a lot of times, there are ways that you can reduce the nutrition in food by cooking it. And that tends to be with things like vegetables where you cook them and they are in water. And so in the process, you've broken down a lot of their bonds and the molecules are now in solution and you pour the solution off. So, so it is possible to reduce it, but uh, the food itself, it does, if, you, if you break that down, it's not worse. Okay, just two overheads left here. This is an interesting one, I think. Snake venom. Whoops, I did have a, a couple of pictures here. Sorry, this is super close up of the tooth. Here's your stomach uh, gastric pit. So you don't produce the, the acid until the food is there. But this question here, snake venom is a mixture of toxic proteins. And a fun carnival trick that, that people do is they take a venomous snake, something that's poisonous, and you hold on to it. If you get your hand behind the head and you, know, you hold your, your finger, you can keep it from biting you. And you hold up a cup right here. Uh, you'll see their, their fangs, uh, the, the incisors, and you can get them to squirt the venom into a cup. You can have a snake that is absolutely lethal. If it bites you, you die. And you can take this venom and you can drink it. And it doesn't kill the person who does this. So think about why would this be that you could you could consume this venom and not be poisoned by it? Because when it like bites you, it just keeps working. Like this one, your stomach is like exactly. When when something bites you, they have these these teeth. They go in. They squirt the venom right into your bloodstream. They bypass your digestive system. We've just talked about how if you consume protein, 
It doesn't get broken down in your mouth. It goes into your stomach. The hydrochloric acid and the pepsin break it down. Then it becomes just harmless amino acids. And so it's okay in your mouth. Now, why would I recommend that you not do this? It is, it is actually a very, very bad idea. Cuts in your mouth. And so there can be openings from your mouth directly to your bloodstream. And so, you know, this is why uh, you'll hear for a whole variety of reasons, things that generally uh, are only bad for you if they get into your bloodstream. You don't want to have them in your mouth. All right, the last of our take home messages would be this. So harsh mechanical and chemical processes. So that's the chewing and churning. That's the hydrochloric acid and the amylase as well as the pepsin. Aid in the first steps of digestion. And I will stop here for the day. Have a good weekend.